All right, so this is going to be our introduction to DNA. And if you're following along, we did skip a couple sections in the textbook. Uh, Campbell likes to start with looking at chromosomes and more of Mendel's ideas, but I think it's important that we start with this molecule of DNA and exactly how its structure and function um, influences the genetics that happens in an organism. So we are skipping ahead to chapter 16 if you're following along. All right, now the part of our webcast today is just brief history. Um, I just want to introduce you to some of the important people that were involved with our DNA projects. I've never really seen these come about that you would have to know the bits and pieces of information. Um, I have seen this though in questions where they will give you the general idea and you need to apply uh, what these people found to um, how we know nucleic acids to work today. So knowing the exact things, not so much, but being able to apply it is kind of the big deal. All right, so we're going to start with uh, T.H. Morgan, Thompson Morgan, did all of his work on fruit flies, and I would gladly donate some of the fruit flies in my classroom uh, to help him further that. However, you'll see the timeline here, we're looking um, early 1900s, so he is uh, long gone, uh, but he worked with Dros Drosophila, that is a fruit, fruit fly scientific name, and what he did was he started looking at smashes of fruit fly chromosomes, and you'll see those pictures down there at A and B. We had some pretty big advances happen in microscopes during this time and being able to polish lenses a lot cleaner so we could start to see these. And what he did, fruit flies only have four chromosomes so they're very easy um, to look at under the microscope. But he said that a fruit fly's eye color was dependent upon whether or not a certain chromosome was in this in the smash of that sample and he looked at what he called the amber eyes or the wild type eyes take on an orange look and then he also looked at the white eyed uh, variety also So his conclusions on this, if we're talking about genes, they're talking about why things appear or look the way they do, it must have something to do with this chromosome business because he saw that if there were different colored eyes, um, then you had a different chromosome that was present. But of course, with much of science, um, how it works, typically once you kind of come to one conclusion, then you've got a million other questions to ask. And the next question that um, Morgan proposed in some of his journals and some of his writings was, is it a protein then um, that is causing this, or is it the DNA of the chromosomes that are in the genes? And initially, we thought a lot of this had to do with proteins. Um, we thought that that was the genetic material. And the reason why we thought this was proteins were something that we could isolate and separate. We had no idea what DNA was or how it looked. DNA was a proposed um, molecule that was out there. We had no way of looking at DNA. So Griffin uh, did a series of experiments out at a, probably about the same time that Morgan was doing this. And I have to make a comment here that I think that the as we look at the span of these years, if they would have had the technology that they had today and been able to communicate a lot easier, the series of experiments probably would have happened much um, shorter in a shorter time span. So what Griffin looked at, he uh, experimented with mice, and he looked at a type of pneumonia bacteria. Um, there was a harmless bacteria that he called rough bacteria. Um, he mixed that harmless one with a heat-killed pathogenic one, which he called smooth, and that smooth one would cause a disease in mice that would kill them. And this, he had, he, what he was looking at is as these bacteria reproduced, the rough, which would, was harmless, would sometimes end up transforming into a dead bacteria to a live bacteria. And whatever was transformed or whatever was passed had to be what was responsible for killing the mice. 
and he talked about this in his paper as a transforming principle. So take a look at these mice pictures that we have. Um, if you would put a live uh, pathogenic strain of bacteria, and again, um, he characterized these bacteria is by looking at their um, whether they were gram positive or gram negative and some of you who are on microbiology I know you just finished up a unit on that um, if you had a live pathogenic strain mice were dead they were gone if you put a live non pathogenic strain into the bacteria mice lived had no problem with that if you put a heat killed meaning you pretty much tried to denature as much of the enzyme that you could into the live mice, they were fine too. However, if you mixed a pathogenic heat killed with a non-pathogenic, somewhere along the line, those mice died. And so the transformation that he referred to was this change in the phenotype. And the phenotype that we're talking about here is um, killing or non-killed. So there must have been something in that heat killed bacteria that could still transmit disease causing properties. That was pretty much the end of his experiment, and who picked up on this um, was Alvary, McClarity, and McLeod. They took these very same bacteria strains that he was working at, and they purified uh, DNA, and again, they weren't entirely sure what they had in this case was DNA. Ended up, it looked a little more like a protein type based. Uh, product and proteins and they would inject the protein into the bacteria and there was no effect. However, if they would inject the DNA into the bacteria, that second thing that they purified, they did see the transformation happen. Um, so now what this discovery told us um, was we have our first evidence that there's something that is not protein based causing this to occur, but you've got this brand new substance called DNA and that was our genetic material. So that was a pretty um, um, major conclusion in this whole process, and it sparked the interest now of scientists as to, okay, so if it's not protein, then what is the substance? What is DNA? What is it all about? So one of the first things that the scientists wanted to do was, okay, with this brand new substance that we have, what the heck is in it? Um, so Hershey and Chase were a group of scientists. We call this the classic blender experiment, and you'll see why here in a minute. Um, they worked with something that's called a bacteriophage. Um, it's a virus that targets just bacteria. And what happened is they took a particular strain of a bacteriophage, they grew it in two different mediums. One that had radioactive sulfur, and one that had radioactive phosphorus. So the sulfur, um, we knew that this was a pretty major component of proteins, and the phosphorus was one of the elements that we were finding was a pretty major component in DNA. So let's just, you know, confirm that this is indeed what's happening, that we have a material that's passing information and it's not a protein, so that's what we're looking for. So again, here's a picture. Um, what would have happened in our first one right over here? Um, this little bacteriophage ha would have a protein coat on the outside, and that's where you'd find the radioactive sulfur. And then this little guy over here, he would have radioactive phosphorus, and that's in the inside where we know the genetic material was. So what they did, they let the bacteriophage inject the cells. Um, you can remove them then from the outside of the surface of the cell and look and see what's found um, inside of your bacteria. Um, do you have sulfur in the inside or do you have phosphorus on the inside? And I think the picture um, gives you the, the conclusion that they had which radioactive marker is found and indeed it was the phosphorus. So the viral genetic information was carried in the DNA and that was just another confirmation. Um, that he had. Again, the sulfur did not enter the bacteria. They just stayed outside of the bacteria. The phosphorus, however, did. So now we know DNA is that transforming factor. And this goes back, you know, now a couple um, different experiments. So here's a picture of Hershey and Chase. And again, we're looking, you know, 1969, 1950s, somewhere in there for these discoveries. 
we go into a little bit more and one of the technologies that hap that helped us here um, was again we had some better microscope technology um, and better centrifuges that were able to separate um, using different molecular weights and we look at um, a gentleman named Shargoff and he was really responsible for coming up with DNA's composition we call these Shargoff's rolls. Um, we do see that this does vary typically from species to species not all four bases are in an equal quantity however um, the bases do present a characteristic ratio typically the amount of A's that you have is very similar to the amount of T's and the amount of G's that you have are very similar to the amount of C's now if you need a refresher A stands for adenine T stands for thymine G stands for guanine and C stands for cytosine so those will come up some of our nitrogenous bases with the DNA we still though did not know how all these parts and pieces fit together and who really gave us those ideas um, were Watson and Crick. Um, they developed the double helix model of DNA. Um, sadly enough though Watson and Crick typically get all of the credit. Um, Rosalind Franklin, Maurice Wilkins, Linus Paulding, they had serious major roles to play in this um, and sometimes they are left out of the uh, information that's given with the structure of DNA so I want to make sure I give them their due um, regards um, but again looking at Watson and Crick they published um, an article in Nature in 1953 it was roughly a page a page and a half depending upon what edition you look at um, but it basically set up that uh, there is a sugar phosphorus backbone um, to DNA and using Shargoff's rules there are certain base pairings that occur um, that build something that looks like a double helix and the idea really came from Rosen Frank Franklin she was um, the leading researcher in doing something that's called uh, x-ray um, crystallography, crystallography I think is how you say that and so she would take x-ray pictures of DNA molecules and she came up with pictures that look like this um, and if you can imagine looking down a spiral staircase um, this is kind of a pivoting point here this is exactly what you would see and I'll show you a model in class that illustrates that a little better all right, so hopefully that is a good kind of brief background on how we came up with this whole idea of DNA. And uh, stay tuned for more information in class.